later on when someone comes, we'll try and do a demonstration of uh, the bioimpedance machine. I know there was a question earlier in one of my groups talking about someone with a cough and I was saying, oh, I suspect this person might be fluid overloaded. But detecting fluid overload is very difficult. If they've got edema, raised JVP, and they've got obvious pulmonary edema, then it's very easy. But patients, I find, often are slightly overloaded and it's not that straightforward. So a bioimpedance machine, I think, is, is helpful. So we'll demonstrate that later. But whilst we're waiting, um, are there any questions that have arisen from any of the three sessions earlier that you would like to ask us. So the floor is open to you. Please ask any questions you would like. Can you, Nura? Thank you, sir. Actually, I have one question. Which one is the much better, APD or CAPD? I think that's a very good question. Um, do you want to start? So, what what do you say, Dr. Sakib? So, what if some if your patient came and asked you, is APD better or CAPD? What what's your response? Uh, actually, we have no experience in APD. So, theoretically, I think APD is better. If it is available, it's better. Okay, so my my response is, in the in the main, it makes very little difference. It depends on the patient, and in my case scenarios, what I was trying to explain is that it's less me dictate to him what they must use, but they tell me what their lifestyle is, and how I can adapt my dialysis to their lifestyle. So instinctively you would say, of course APD is better. I don't have to do any dialysis during the day. And that's true. And lots of people choose APD for that reason in my institute. However, some patients come to me and say, yes, that's great, but I travel. I need to go, I'm a salesman. I need to travel around the country. And then for them to take an APD machine and APD, you need more fluids. Each bag, instead of two litres, is five litres, and they usually need two of those. So then they need 10 litres, plus they need a last fill of two litres. So they need to carry 12 kilos, plus an APD machine, which is about 15 kilos, just to go away for one night. And in those cases, doing CAPD is easier. So my answer is, there is no particular better. The better one is whatever suits the patient. And always, it's a goals-directed prescribing, not me tell you what to do. The one scenario where I think APD is something I would press is that for the patients who are high transporters. So if you're a high transporter, Dr. Sarkip has already explained, you absorb the glucose very quickly. So there you need very short dwells. And it's unrealistic to ask patients to do two hour dwells during the day because then they do nothing else. So for those patients who are high transporters, I would recommend APD. Otherwise, I don't I try not to make a recommendation and I try to ask them which one would suit their lifestyle. And I work through what's more important, having less to do during the day or having the freedom to travel. And some people find setting up the APD machine very difficult. It's not easy. You know, you have to program the machine, the more lines. So some people find it easier to do CAPD. So there's no right or wrong answer to your question of which is better. For the high transporter, APD is better. But otherwise, it's dependent on what the patient preference is. So what I don't want people to go away and say is, oh, no, we don't have APD. We can't do PD in this country because APD is only absolutely necessary for only high transporters. So don't feel discouraged if you don't have APD machines. You can still do very successful CAPD. And Hong Kong is a very good example. So although they do have APD machines, they are quite restricted because the patients have to buy it or it's given to them by charity, loaned to them by charity. So they're quite limited in the number of APD machines they have in Hong Kong, and they mostly do CAPD. And obviously, you know, Hong Kong is 
a very successful PD um, community. Next question. Patient is diabetic and is on CAPD. And what about the management uh, regarding insulin therapy? How to uh, manage her glycemic status? Clara, how would you manage diabetics on CAPD? Yeah. What was the management before CAPD? Then you continue the same insulin therapy and monitor the blood uh, blood sugar. If the blood sugar is higher, then you tailor your insulin to that. So you just increase the insulin. A uh, patient is uh, having high glucose in PD fluid. Okay. And then uh, management can be changed. But some patients, they will not need much. Um, they will not need much difference and some they need more so it is always based on the experience thank you so there so, are no rules yeah I, so I would just treat if so 1.5% uh, I find doesn't tend to affect the glucose too much it may do a little bit in which case you may need to just adjust their basal um, glucose so their um, uh, insulatard or their long-acting glucose but I agree when you start using the, especially the 4.25%, that may cause quite an acute excursion. And I just treat that as a meal. And if you calculate the amount of glucose in that bag and the amount that is absorbed, I mean, it's equivalent of eating sort of a, a large um, chocolate bar. Okay, so what would you advise to a patient who eats a chocolate bar? Okay, I know you'd say avoid eating chocolate bars, but if they have to eat a chocolate bar, then obviously you advise them to give an extra shot of Atrapid to take into that account because that will last four hours. Now I know the Atrapid probably won't last for four hours, so you'll lose a little bit at the end, but you'll at least blunt some of the uh, peak hyperglycemia. So just treat it as another meal, or if they're exchanging at dinner time, then you just expect that meal to be a bigger meal. So just consider it and adjust your insulin as you would any other for any other diabetic patient. I want to add one thing. And you, yeah, you have an option you can uh, also use your insulin in the medication port. So you, uh, the patient requirement may be less. Uh, there have a study, yeah. Uh, you can reduce the cost of insulin up to one third. Some patient, uh, uh, you may add the insulin in the medication port. That, that's actually a very effective way, and my yeah. diabetologists have always asked me to do that. Have you tried it? We have tried some patients, but uh, uh, oh, oh yeah, uh, it's good, but not always, because uh, patient we are taking long uh, in the skin. So I think it's better, doctor, not uh, yeah. to so, say. So the studies are very effective. If you give it in the PD bag, it's very effective and it smooths out the uh, diabetic excursion very well. The worry is infection, okay? So they have to inject every bag or the, whatever bags they inject and that the potential for peritonitis makes me not use it in my, in my institute. But I know the diabetologists for very difficult cases, very difficult cases, they have asked me if, for permission to inject and then I give them, say yes, okay. Uh, but I try to avoid that. But I know it is very, very effective. So that's a good point. Well, well done. If you do use insulin in the PD fluid bag, is there a dose of what you should do? How much? Okay, well, okay help me. <laughs> uh, they, they have different studies, but the usual uh, rules is usually you can reduce the dose one third, up to one third. Usually, uh, requirement is less. Kato tuko? Apni J dose ta diten, suppose apni 15 diten. Hey, wait, wait, apni medication port di di benarki. 
কিন্তু রিকোয়ারমেন্ট কম হবে আপনি কস্ট কমাইতে পারবেন বাট যেটা চিন্তার বিষয় হচ্ছে ইনফেকশন আর কি যে বারে বারে সে মেডিকেশন পোর্টটা ইউজ করবে যদি ওইভাবে ইউজ না করতে পারে তাহলে ইনফেকশন হয়ে যাবে কিন্তু ইট ইজ হাইলি রিকমেন্ডেড অনেক জায়গায় এটা বলা হয় যে আপনি এটা ইউজ করেন We have used only two or three patient like this. Short yeah, acting. Short so my, acting. my understanding of this is to use a short acting. So you can't replace all the insulin. Um, when I've used it is to try and re when they use the orange bags, when they use the 4.25% and they go completely out of control. Um, my argument is that clearly the patient isn't giving enough Actrapid subcutaneously but sometimes when you give a lot of actrapid subcutaneously you get into problems with insulin lumps um, and also they worry that they have to give so much they don't like doing it so in those cases we give the actrapid in the bags and it's a reminder so if they're doing an exchange they forget that that's got glucose if they eat they remember to give injection but when they do dialysis they don't often remember that they have to give an injection so by injecting the bag it sort of trains them to to give some insulin and i think sarkib is actually right the, the exact amount because we don't know how much is needed to control so if the diabetologist say to me this hba1c is uh, 90 and uh, we know if his blood glucose goes up to 30 millimoles per liter when he uses an orange bag can we inject the bags then I say yes, and then we have to decide how much to inject, and we don't know. So it's great if you know how much is needed to control, and then you divide it by a third, but usually we don't know. So I always start very low. So I'd inject maybe two units or four units and see what happens, and then increase it and escalate. Because we don't have to gain control in two days. You know, this person has had uncontrolled HbA1Cs of 80, 90 for months. So we just need to do it carefully and safely two two important aspects with diabetes in pd patients is that when you get extra neal remember that suddenly during the extra neal they have no glucose so if they're lucky enough that they can afford extra neal and they use extra neal overnight let's say they were using a 2.5 percent glucose bag overnight and they suddenly switch over to extra neal which is good for the ultrafiltration you have to remember they will go hypoglycemic in the middle of the night unaware unless you reduce their insulin so you have to anticipate that and similarly when they move from pd to hemodialysis suddenly they have much less glucose so you must remember otherwise they will go very hypo and the real worry i think um, nura can talk about is actually how hypoglycemic your hemodialysis patients are getting so I'm going to turn this subject around completely and actually talk about your um, blood glucose control during hemodialysis in Bangladesh. And uh, anyone have want to make any comments about the blood glucose during a hemodialysis session? How many times do your diabetics go hypoglycemic? Can we use insulin pump? Uh, during uh, when we giving CAPD because as there is a persistent uh, catheter like catheter in the subcutaneous is there any difficult uh, difficulty developed no our, our, our type 1 diabetics who have insulin pumps are very very successful especially if they had feedback loop like an uh, artificial uh, pancreas where they have um, uh, continuous glucose monitoring which links in to their glucose pumps and adjusts they're very, very, very successful, and obviously you can do that in PD. That's not a problem. So, uh, uh, can it be possible to use the uh, uh, insulin pump in CAD, CAPD cases? Yes. Because we, uh, if, if any, uh, if there is uh, blood glucose is high, then insulin pump can sense it, and then I. Correct. Insulin. Correct. So the other, yeah. So obviously, if you start using your insulin pump, that's even better. Um, and it's even better if you have the feedback loop with the continuous glucose monitoring. So just having a glucose pump, if you use a, an orange bag, your glucose will still go up. It's only if you have the, the sensor which feeds back and increases the delivery of glucose, that's when you'll improve. Um, so yes, 
you can use glucose pump but actually the first step if you really want to is just have a continuous glucose monitor so you can see how good or bad the diabetic control is with the medication port you can use also antibiotics if the other reasons also required not for peritonitis you can use antibiotics even potassium chloride if it's hypokalemic and you can also use erythropoietin uh, with the medication port if your patient is required But to go back to the hypoglycemia on hemodialysis, how often do you see that going hypo on hemodialysis? So, Noura, do you want to comment about that? Because I know you did some work. I'm not a nephrologist. I just manage things. So I have to manage the nephrologist also. So I am answering, I think, as I was looking for that, my colleagues, doctors, and answer your questions, but no one is answering that because we do on an average 300 dialysis sessions every day, and uh, hypoglycemia is a regular phenomenon. So what we do, every hourly we monitor the physical, uh, the glucometer with the sugar level. So if we see, if you see in our world that when there is a, in every cell and stands also at 20, 25% glucose is standing there always because Absolutely. it's a common phenomenon. Why? It's a common phenomenon and uh, uh, but interesting enough as a, most of the, the biggest concern all over the world is the relationship of diabetes and, and uh, chronic renal failure. But in our cases here, um, I think the most of the patients are hypertensive background than uh, diabetic background so it's a it's a common phenomenon so that's why uh, so we produce my, my impression is that it's a lot more common here than it is in london and it, it was fascinating because Dura did some work doing continuous glucose monitoring during your hemodialysis session and saw they all fell and that's because your dial what's the glucose concentration in your dialysate Yes, this is one of the, the second concern I just want to raise to you, the first comments you are raised, is the re questions of pe whose preference is the treatment modules. Is it the patient preference or the doctor's preference or the institutional preference? Who is paying? In our case, it's the patient paying. We think that it is the patient who is paying everything. In our part of the world, everyone gives the examples of Japan, United States, Hong Kong, UK, because most of the patients are uh, sponsored by health insurance or state, some sort of. Here it doesn't matter. So when we think about doctor's preference or institutional preference, usually patients don't continue their treatment because dialysis is a continuous phenomenon until the patient dies. So if we think about patient preference, we also have to think about certain things like insulin pre insulin pumps and all these things. But as a manager, I think it's not implementable in a setting like Bangladesh. This is an experience from a 300 patients dialysis every day we do here. It's a regular phenomenon, patient going to hyper, we have to think about alternatives, not the technological alternatives which we cannot afford. So patient preference is the main thing, which is within bracket there is a word in very much we have dilemma is the affordability. Thank you very much. No, I, I completely agree. And that's my whole ethos of my sort of workshop groups is that everything should be about patient preference. Because as you say, there's no point in me prescribing APD here when the patient can't afford it, because then they'll use it for one month and then run out of money. So we have to prescribe according to what the patient wants. Now, luckily, when I prescribe, I don't have to worry about the payment but I still have to worry about what the patient wants. And here, you have to worry about what the patients want by what the patient can also afford. I completely agree. Um, but the question directly is, will insulin pumps work? And yes, it will work very well. And if you can afford it, that's a very good solution. For hemodialysis, it's very interesting that your dialysate solutions, hemodialysate solution has zero glucose Okay, so I'm not surprised that you are all going hypoglycemic on your dialysis machines. It would be surprising if you didn't, because you're dialyzing against zero. So you're trying to get them hypoglycemic. 
and I could never understand, but the Dallas 8 Solutions in the UK has four millimoles of glucose in it. So our incidence of hypoglycemia is actually much, much, much less because the lowest in theory they can go is four millimoles. Okay. Now, so the big question which I've never quite understood is why is there the difference both here and in Nepal and in Pakistan? I suspect it's to do with infections uh, and bacterial growth in, in glucose, I, but I don't know. But that's something which you guys can think about and ask and challenge. Everyone is fear about the technology and dialysis fluid was not used to be prepared in Bangladesh five or six years back. So when we started the dialysis machines and then uh, some of the companies and then our pharmaceuticals companies started making dialysis fluid. So you need so, to ask them, what's the risk of adding glucose? Yes, th that is the the biggest thing is that, the, but the t the technical thing is that the fluid approved so far in Bangladesh is recently it's without glucose but now the government is also started to adding uh, there is a separate fluid but it is not that much still now in a cost effective way countries like India they try their own fluid within the institutions where you can have a extra pouch of glucose which you can add it into the fluids we saw it in India and even even in Pakistan also so, uh, but in Bangladesh, we have, there are fluids with glucose, but it's very uh, short supply or very rarely used. So that's why here we alternatively use the 20% glucose, thinking about that, that these patients will go into hyperglycemia anyway. Thank you. Okay, if there's no more questions, I think um, for those people who are interested to see a bioimpedance machine, um, we can try and demonstrate it on two patients if you like. Um, for those who are less interested, I suppose you can go and have lunch. <laughs> okay, so do we need, is that okay or do we need a bed sheet? Okay. So, so, Noura, if you can wait in the way, then you can wait in the way.
beta. Okay, but there's less water to conduct. So in a way, this is just a bit of water. The other thing to remember is that cells are cell membranes. So they act as capacitors. So if you apply a alternating current, then imagine you alternate the current, the will start releasing it. So, it measures the resistance. So this is just the direct current. The alternating current is zero. It's going to be... Um, so, if you do this measurement, and you set the machine to have just direct current, the measurement will be directly related to how much water is in the body. If you turn the frequency up, okay, then you're charging the cells and then stopping and allowing the cells to discharge. So then the current you're measuring is directly proportional to the amount of cells there are and the amount of fat cells that in particular there are. So as you increase the frequency, you're actually measuring more and more um, because as it's been released, it's essentially going to measure your total body water. Okay, so if you have a direct current, you're only measuring the extracellular water. But if you're having a high frequency, you're going to be measure total body water. So if you have the extracellular volume, the total body water, you know your mass, you know roughly the proportion of fat and muscle in an average female who is 40, no, age. Sorry, I also need her age. Sorry, how, is, how old is she? So then you know her age is 44, okay? Then you can put it in various equations and then it will give you an estimate of what the overhydration level is. And it will also give you body composition. So that's the name of the BCM, is body composition monitor. So it will also give you how much lean tissue mass and fat tissue mass. So first of all, we need to just establish the electrode contacts on the hand and the foot. And to get good contact, if they use lotion, then it won't stick. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is just to wipe the skin um, to remove the, any, any lotion on it. So there are different bioimpedance machines. So this one is by Fresenius, and it just has four electrodes, so two on one arm and two on the foot. Um, depending on the machine you get, sometimes they have eight electrodes, so it measures on both arms and both feet. And some bioimpedance machine actually just measures in regional, because they argue that um, what you need to know is just how much fluid is in the limbs, and that will give you a better estimate because obviously in the abdomen you have um, ascites and things like that, so that can sometimes complex. So some machines will just do regional um, by impedance, but this machine does whole body with just four electrodes. Okay, so now that she's cleaned the skin, she's going to apply the electrodes um, in the hand, so one electrode there, one at the wrist. Oh, I suppose just to say, in theory, um, if they have prosthetic limbs, that can sometimes affect the, or, or uh, prosthetic hip and things, that can sometimes affect. And also, if they have a pacemaker, people have worried in the past about what um, would happen if you start passing electrical currents when they have a pacemaker. Um, so usually we avoid doing bioimpedance in people with pacemakers, although actually it has been tested and it is safe. 
but it is something which we try to avoid. Okay, so as she's just attaching, so we need to just program the machine because as I say, the machine, the equations depends on her age, her weight, as well as her, uh, her gender. Okay, so I'm just going to program, so it, to a female, her weight is 47 kilos. So the accuracy of this is the most important thing as well. It's not just a rough estimate, but you should have the weight to uh, the one decimal place. Okay, 47 kilos, and the height is uh, 157 centimeters. And age is 47, 44. Okay. Okay. So if you just tell her whilst this is measuring, I know she's lying very flat, so just stay lying flat. And it's important that uh, she's not touching herself because otherwise she's short circuiting. So if her hands was lying on her, her legs, for example, then she may be short circuiting. You want the electrical current to go through the whole body. So that's excellent. If she was crossing her legs, that would cause complications. So the way she's doing is perfect. Okay. And she's not moving around. Perfect. So one beep to start measuring. And you can see here, well, you can't see, but I can see that it's giving a curve. Okay, and what curve, what that curve was, is it was doing multiple frequencies. So it was measuring the resistance and um, the resistance. Actually, before you see this, I should have asked you to estimate how many liters you thought she was before we did this, okay? But uh, so you, each dot on that curve is at a different frequency. And it measures at a frequency between, I think, 50 hertz to 5,000 hertz. I can't remember exactly. I have to read the manual. And then it extrapolates to what the resistance would be at zero. In other words, measuring just extracellular water and at a theoretical um, frequency of infinity which then means it's measuring the conductance uh, of the total body water. Okay, so those are the two values it then uses. And then it puts in the equation and it says the overhydration here is 3.7. Okay, oops, back. So the V volume of urea volume of distribution is 25 liters. Over. So total body water is 28.0, uh, extracellular water is 14.1 litres, uh, intracellular water is 13.9, and the lean tissue index, so that's the lean tissue mass divided by height uh, squared, is 12.4, fat tissue index 5.1, lean tissue mass 30.6, uh, fat tissue mass 9.2, uh, adipose tissue mass 12.5, body cell mass 16.6, and then quality of, of 97. So that's just it, how good the calculation it thinks is compared to what it's expecting and the norms. So 97 is quite good. Anything over 90 is, is considered quite good. So for quality, you look at this Q as well as the shape of the curve. So both of them are good. So this is a quite a reliable reading. Okay, great. Okay, so then we can disconnect and then say thank you. Okay. And then we can take the, uh, the leads off. Okay, so several things. Firstly, what would be interesting is if you examine her and you feel, do you think how many liters you think she is overhydrated? What I have found is don't prescribe your UF 
based on that value. This is consistent, but it's based on normal ground. So it's not accurate for everybody, but it is consistent. So some people, it will always show high readings, but rel at a relatively consistent level. So especially the diabetic patients who are fluid overloaded, but they've got the salt mostly stored in, in the muscle or the skin, they almost always show very high hydration status and it's very difficult to get them down. And if you do try and get them down, you're probably going to get them hypotensive and you're going to over diuresis, and you may lose residual renal function. But what's there important is that they may always stay 2.0 overhydrated, but it's very useful then to see whether it increases. So in my PD patients, if they come back to me every three months and it starts off at 1.5, at 1.5, I wouldn't worry too much. But next time they come, it's 1.7 and then 1.8 and then 2 and then 2.2. So then I have a trend. So the most important thing is not to treat just one reading, but to treat the trends. So if I see an increasing trend, then I am beginning to worry that they are accumulating salt and water and I need to do something about it. And similarly for the lean tissue index and the fat tissue mass, that's very useful in PD because of the glucose, they often become fat, but if they're under dialyzed, they lose lean tissue mass. So if you go on the weight alone, they look stable or they may even increase in weight and you may think, oh, that's good. They're gaining weight, but actually they're gaining fat and losing muscle. So that's a bad sign as well. So it's not about the absolute number, but it is about the trends. Okay. Uh, so it, they are different ways of the calculation so i can't remember exactly what they call so it they, they divide the body into different parts and then the bone comes into it as well so where does bone fit it's not lean tissue or fat tissue so it it gets divided a little bit there and then there's another equation which says okay how much is considered adipose so it's just down to the definitions i don't think you should worry too much about it i basically look at the lean tissue mass and the fat tissue mass as a given idea of whether there's changes in the body composition over time and in which direction. Okay, so that's my good take two kilos off. Ma, to show you a problem, huh? Apna. 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 Apna.
ওটা উপরে লাগাতে হবে লালটা নিচে